One thing about spending so much time in North Korea is that I've encountered quite a cast of characters there. And one of the most colorful foreigners was a man named Alejandro Cao de Benos, a Spaniard who used to turn up at events dressed in a North Korean military uniform. He used to introduce himself by a Korean name, Jo Sun Il. That's a name that means Korea is one. He's a true believer in North Korea, and he's not shy about it. Here he is speaking to the BBC World Service in 2013. I felt very attracted for the strength of the Korean people being such a small nation, and not only politically, but spiritually, and uh, about the certain aspects of the human behavior that are lost in Western societies, like honor, discipline, uh, commitment, respect for the family, that are still preserved today in North Korea, and that I feel myself identify with. When I first met him in Pyongyang, he told me that his interest in communism in North Korea started when he was a teenager, But that interest wouldn't be just academic. Alejandro would become one of its most visible and vocal cheerleaders. He became the founder and president of the Korean Friendship Association, the KFA. That's a volunteer group for North Korea fans that says it has more than 17,000 members in 120 countries. The KFA says it aims to show the reality of North Korea to the world. For Alejandro, that includes denying all evidence of the regime's dire human rights record, which is exactly what he did during that BBC interview. So do you say that there are no concentration camps in North Korea? Do you say that there are no prison camps where people are tortured? No, 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 no. We don't have concentration camps. What about torture? No, not at all. Not at all. This is not used. Notice that he says we when talking about North Korea. Alejandro has really jumped into the deep end. He even opened a North Korean themed bar back in his hometown of Tarragona in Spain. Alejandro calls himself a special delegate for the North Korean government. And although it's unclear how close he truly is to the regime, it's clear this isn't just a hobby for him. I do import and export joint ventures. That's my source for a living. But do you organize business deals between uh, international businessmen and North Korea? Sure, sure. Right. And, and obviously, uh, North Korea is subject to international sanctions. Do you ever try to break those sanctions? Of course, we have to break them every day. We have to try to find a way for a living. And it cannot be that U.S. is dictating always the fate, economical fate of the world. And in 2019, Alejandro secures the North Korean government's permission to organize a remarkable event, the country's first ever cryptocurrency conference. Its website calls it an opportunity to share knowledge, establish connections, and discuss business opportunities, just the kind of thing Alejandro specializes in. It's intriguing, for sure. I mean, how on earth could there be a tech conference in one of the world's least connected countries? Cryptocurrency experts from around the world begin signing up for what sounds like a wacky, offbeat adventure. But this conference will prove anything but. I was arrested, detained, then put in handcuffs, taken to uh, an interrogation centre. We were genuinely very frightened. From the BBC World Service, this is The Lazarus Heist, Season 2. I'm Jean Lee. And I'm Jeff White. Episode 7, Crypto Comrades. One of the main ways to get to Pyongyang is flying with Air Corio. That's North Korea's state-owned airline. And it's an experience that starts from the moment you check in. I used to fly in from China, and I'd always seem to be lining up behind North Koreans with carts piled high with large screen TVs that they were taking back to Pyongyang. As you settle into your seat, flight attendants wearing white gloves come around distributing the Pyongyang Times, and later, burgers made of a mystery meat that I never, ever ate. A flight attendant makes an announcement at the moment you cross into North Korean airspace. And I think that's when it really starts to sink in that you're about to arrive in North Korea. It's a a wholly bizarre experience. Obviously, you arrive at Pyongyang Airport, which is more or less brand new, but it's an airport with no one in it. (laughs) I think we were the only people, you know, that flight we were on was the only flight getting in. This is Chris Ems, a young British cryptocurrency entrepreneur. He's one of the eight people who signed up for Alejandro's crypto conference. By April 2019, when the conference is held, Chris has already worked in the industry for four years, so he's a veteran in crypto terms. His work takes him all over the place. There was a crypto conference probably on every four corner of the earth on any given day at that point. I was quite a a well-known speaker on the speaker circuit as it was back then. 
So when an invite to a conference in Pyongyang landed in his inbox, Chris says he didn't have any misgivings. He was excited. It was going to be about building friendship between North Korea and people not from North Korea. In the crypto industry, people were very open-minded to building friendships across different nationalities and boundaries. Boundaries. As Chris says, the crypto world gets very excited about crossing them or doing away with them altogether. Because to true believers like Chris, crypto isn't just about people amassing ludicrous Bitcoin fortunes. It's a whole ideology, a fervent belief that the technology behind cryptocurrency can also be used to disrupt and reimagine other elements of society. It's idealistic, heady, sometimes utopian stuff, and it's radically borderless. So, the conference in Pyongyang, why not? I think for all of us, we thought this is a bit of a quirky, strange sort of tourist trip. But on arrival, the eerily empty airport of Pyongyang is already giving the group the sense that this won't be their typical conference experience. And it's when they get to airport security that things go from eerie to unnerving. Um, and one of the things that the, uh, the customs officials at the airport do as soon as you arrive is they go through all of your media on any electronic devices, be that your mobile phone or be that your you know, laptop. So on arriving, one of the participants had, and I, I won't name his name, had um, brought in a, a homemade pornographic video on his laptop, which he deliberately tried to conceal. It was evident from them uncovering it that they are experts in finding these things. This might be a good moment for the conference organiser and official friend of North Korea, Alejandro Caudebenos, to step in and make an appeal for his guileless guest. But he's not actually on the trip. He's not allowed to leave Spain because authorities there confiscated his passport a few years ago after he illegally bought some guns that fire rubber bullets. So Chris and the crew are on their own. Well, sort of. At the airport, they're met by their North Korean guides. Foreign tourists aren't allowed to wander around North Korea on their own. They're assigned minders to be with them at all times, which the government says is to keep them safe. And these minders are very unhappy about that lewd video. On the minibus ride to their hotel, the minders scold the whole group, saying the incident has made them feel shamed and embarrassed. At that point, all of our passports were confiscated. We were told by the, the guides, if you like, that you know this has happened because and because of this gentleman's video that has caused concern. So at that point, everyone's back was up. <laughs> right. We sort of told, well, you'll get your passports back on the way out sort of thing. Were they confiscating them for the duration of the trip? Yeah, I mean, the they, they, they were sort of like, that. we need to take them because of this situation, but, you know, you will get them to return home. But obviously, you're sort of second guessing as to whether that's true or false. There's actually nothing that unusual about this. Most tourists are required to hand over their passports during their stay in North Korea. But it's definitely an unsettling feeling. And the fact that they didn't know it was going to happen is an indication of how unprepared some of them are for a trip to North Korea. After this, the visiting crypto crew start to form bonds pretty fast. The entire group uh, was uh, excited to start uh, such kind of, uh, let's say, an adventure, but also a lot of, uh, how can I say, paying attention to, to our group safety. This is Fabio Pietrosanti an Italian tech entrepreneur and one of Chris's seven conference companions. Once you land in a place that get your passport, inspect your phone and your computer, really trust me, when you land there, you all became brothers, I mean, the group, and we were reminded to, to stay safe, not to make any stupid mistake, because the, the main goal, once you land, is to ensure that you will get safe back. The itinerary for their conference week in Pyongyang begins with three days of the typical North Korean tourist experience, accompanied at all times by their watchful guides. So you're taken up the Juche Tower in Pyongyang. We were taken to see a, a, a beer brewery. We were taken to a school. And then one day to the, uh, to the demilitarized zone to look over into South Korea. And how did you get on as a group? Because as you say, you didn't know any of these other people. What was the sort of feeling among the group? It was a very bizarre atmosphere. I mean, I think there was a lot of gallows humour going on. As a group, when we weren't being sort of observed or with the guides, we'd, we'd crack all sorts of different jokes. You know, are we going to get out of here alive? That's a truly dark joke. Everyone on the trip would have had the story of what happened to Otto Warmbier on their minds, the American student who died after being imprisoned in North Korea for allegedly trying to steal a poster. 
Wombi's case was recent history, so this really isn't a laughing matter. Fabio says the group develops a sort of mantra to keep them going. Our rule is we need to get safe back home. Get back home safely. It's a good rule to live by when you're in North Korea. But Chris and Fabio soon discover that one of their group is less inclined to stay in line. And it's starting to prove to be a bit of a problem. Probably the most vocal person who was talking a, a lot during the excursions was, was Virgil. Virgil Griffith. He's an American and something of a crypto rock star. At the time, he was a developer for the Ethereum Foundation, which is a huge deal in the crypto world. It's the organisation behind Ether, the second most successful cryptocurrency after Bitcoin. And it's fair to say Virgil has a reputation for ruffling feathers. For example, as an undergrad, he attempted to expose security flaws in a college ID card system. The company running that system then sued him. Then Virgil invented a tool that would detect when people or companies were massaging their own Wikipedia entries. Virgil said he did it to create minor PR disasters for companies and organisations I dislike. Virgil is an extremely intelligent and creative person, uh, but he is also a, a peculiar character. He is not a politically correct person. He is a provocative. Uh, Virgil was cracking all sorts of very dark jokes to the, to the guides, which a lot of us were very, very nervous about someone doing. He was asking them about their dating lives. We were told not to ask nothing about politics or political leaders. And Virgil was always asking very curious and intriguing questions like, how did you find a girl here in North Korea? How can you match for a marriage? <laughs> or uh, what happens if you do a car crash? There is a judicial system. Uh, I mean, uh, who decides who is right and who is wrong? And a lot of uh, curiosity of understanding how the country works. So now the group is inside North Korea without their passports, their every move monitored, and they've been lumped together with a loose cannon Fair to say, not your average business trip. After three days of being shown the sights, it's time for the conference to officially begin. I have to say, I go to a lot of conferences, and if I was invited to a cryptocurrency conference in North Korea, I would have some serious reservations about that. If you know anything about cryptocurrency, and these guys are experts, it's not hard to figure out why North Korea might be interested in it. At this point, North Korea is under economic sanctions, pretty much excluding it from the global banking system. Bitcoin, the world's first big cryptocurrency, was invented partly as a way of freeing money from the control of banks and governments. It's a fairly libertarian concept. So cryptocurrency could be a game changer for getting around those sanctions. Plus, you might think these guys would have come across all those media reports of North Korea's hacking exploits. This was hardly a secret by this point in 2019. Remember the huge WannaCry ransomware attack that we covered in season one that was attributed by the US government to the Lazarus Group? That happened two years before this conference. The hackers asked for ransoms to be paid in Bitcoin. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of the digital currency was collected and never recovered. North Korea, of course, denies any involvement in that hack. So the conference is about to kick off and these international crypto experts are looking forward to hearing from their North Korean counterparts. Maybe their host presentations are going to offer a glimpse into what the country has been doing with crypto and why it's decided to hold an entire conference on it in the first place. Well, no, actually. Fabio learns that no North Korean plans to speak at the event. In fact, he discovers the conference organizers haven't really made any plans at all. We just realized that as a group uh, that, hey, there are two days of conference and actually there's no program. Instead, they're told by their minders at the last minute that they are the conference. They have to present all the sessions themselves. They're given an approved list of topics and told to crack on. So we were just basically thrown in the room with these sheets of paper. It was essentially having to improvise. I remember just us all sort of looking at each other bemused. Uh, I think it was on the day or the day before and just, you know, trying to agree who's going to read what. And, and you're sort of expected to almost cobble together a, a presentation on that subject. Exactly. You're just expected to get up and try and work your way through it. Right. And what, what was yours? Um, I think mine was blockchain and finance. If I'd paid thousands of dollars to attend a conference, then found that I'd been pressured into speaking at it, I wouldn't be happy. 
That's the stuff of absolute nightmares for me. I've got sweaty palms just thinking about it. But it's way worse for Chris and Fabio. They're starting to form the very strong impression from their North Korean hosts that there might be consequences if they don't deliver. Before we went into the conference, you know, one of the guys said, this better go well. So we were already very nervous. <laughs> we had to fill the space and we were really worried that uh, not filling the space of the two days of conference uh, could have created a problem with our major goal, that is uh, return back safe home. <laughs> On day five, the conference finally begins at the Sci Tech Complex in Pyongyang. I have attended a conference here. It's a shiny new tech center shaped like an atom with an enormous replica of a long-range rocket right in the heart of the main hall. There's no hiding what the goals are here. The foreign visitors are taken into a conference room where North Koreans are already seated and waiting for their presentations. It's not clear to our foreign visitors who any of the people in the audience are. But there's welcome news. They don't have to worry about giving an unforgettable speech after all. While as an interpreter translating the presentations for the North Koreans in attendance, the audience aren't exactly pepped up to hear them. The people who were in the room were, were falling asleep. There were at least two, three persons that slept over the conference over the two days. The general interest was were very, well, very low. After two days of hastily prepped presentations, the so-called conference officially closes. The crypto bros didn't get to learn anything about what North Korea is doing, or indeed not doing, with cryptocurrency. So much for the exchange of ideas. It's not clear to them what the whole conference was really for, or why they'd been invited in the first place. Still, a few encounters at their hotel bar seem to offer an answer to that question. The guides take them for karaoke. North Koreans are amazing singers in my own experience and they get to sample some North Korean snake wine. It's an acquired taste. So far, so innocent, but that's not all that happened. Fabio says that at this hotel bar, the group were approached by foreign businessmen. A man they thought was Taiwanese asked if they'd be interested in helping him with an oil venture, which is interesting because oil is a hotly sanctioned commodity in North Korea. The group said, no thanks. And another foreign conference attendee said that a stranger asked to use his name to secure a loan to buy a North Korean bank. Again, he declined to help out. Sounds a bit shady. Maybe the real reason Alejandro Cao de Benos convened this conference was to bring foreigners into the country to see if any of them might be interested in doing business. But Fabio and Chris say the group wanted nothing to do with these barroom businessmen. They have just one mission, remember, to get back home safely. And on the morning of the final day, they're taken back to the airport and reunited with their passports. The minute that my uh, passport was stamped, you know, when, as you're leaving, I've, I felt a sigh of relief. <laughs> Still, it wasn't a complete waste of time. I mean, they visited Pyongyang, they had an adventure, they kept out of trouble, got back home safe. But it's after the conference when the real trouble begins, especially for the most provocative participant, Virgil Griffith. The FBI asked if they could meet him to talk about his trip to North Korea. And I said, Virgil, whatever you do, please don't go there by yourself. Take a lawyer with you. While Virgil Griffith was playing with fire in Pyongyang, asking all those curious questions of his North Korean guides, it turns out it wasn't really the North Koreans he had to worry about. All the conference goers knew they were being monitored at every turn in North Korea. But what they perhaps didn't realise was that their trip was also being watched with interest from afar by the FBI. It seems like the inaugural Pyongyang Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Conference was not such a non-event after all, certainly in the case of Virgil Griffith. We wanted to interview Virgil, but it's a bit tricky because, spoiler alert, he's currently in a federal prison in Pennsylvania serving a five-year sentence for conspiring to violate US sanctions on North Korea. He's a smart guy. And that would be the most incredibly stupid thing to do. That would involve a level of, um, of evil and stupidity combined together that Virgil simply is not capable of. Someone who knows Virgil well is his friend, the writer Emmanuel Goldstein. He's a bit of a legend in hacker circles. He runs a magazine about hacking that started out as a newsletter way back in 1984. Hence his name. It's actually a pseudonym. Emmanuel Goldstein, of course, is a reference to a character in George Orwell's novel 1984. Emmanuel met Virgil through hacking circles in the U.S. and was immediately impressed. Basically, he's a one-man think tank. You know, he's somebody who just <laughs> will take the impossible and make it possible. And that's what he lives for. 
But when Emmanuel found out Virgil was thinking of traveling to North Korea, he was worried. When he went there, I was scared to death for him because he has this way of being very open, this way of, of being honest. In North Korea, that can go badly very quickly. Did you speak to him after that, in the, in the interim between when he came back from the conference and when things went uh, sideways? Yes, I, I talked to him a couple of times after that. What did he make of it? What was, what was his reflections on it at that point? Oh, he, he was filled with stories about uh, what, uh, what North Korea was like, the things that he had seen, the statues, the newspapers, the propaganda on television. And, you know, it was, it was told with the enthusiasm of somebody who had just seen something completely alien. It's not in any way embracing that. It's, it, it's horrible. He knows that. He said that. A few months after his trip, the FBI gets in touch with Virgil. They want to ask him some questions about it. And I said, Virgil, whatever you do, please don't go there by yourself. Take a lawyer with you. And he was convinced that there was no problem in him talking to the FBI on his own. He thought he was helping. And um, I remember seeing him that night after he had had the meeting. I'd never seen him prouder. He basically, he had given them North Korean newspapers. He had gotten all kinds of uh, souvenirs from the FBI. And that was it. But that wasn't it. A few months later, in November 2019, Virgil Griffith is arrested by the FBI. And he's charged with conspiring to violate U.S. sanctions on North Korea. And that was basically the first indication that they didn't think it wasn't a big deal. The first thing U.S. authorities take issue with is that Virgil violated travel restrictions on Americans going to North Korea, put in place in response to the Otto Warmbier incident. Virgil was well aware of the rules. He'd even written to the U.S. State Department seeking their special permission to attend the conference. They'd given him a firm no, and that's probably when Virgil first came up on their radar. So Virgil decides to go ahead and attend the conference anyway, gets a visa from the North Korean mission in New York, but this isn't the only reason Virgil's now in trouble. In the court proceedings that follow his arrest, the FBI presents some pretty jaw-dropping evidence. By going through Virgil's emails and phone messages, they discover that for more than a year before the conference, Virgil was working on a plan to import cryptocurrency equipment into the country. Specifically, he discussed sending them a piece of kit that can create new cryptocurrency coins, and also setting up a thing called a node, which validates crypto transactions. Back in April 2018, so that's exactly a year before the conference, Virgil was in touch with someone who was making regular trips into North Korea, someone he hoped could help him with this venture. And he began discussing it with other people as well. In emails and texts, he says his plan to send crypto technology into North Korea will make it possible for them to avoid sanctions on money transfers and help them circumvent the current sanctions on them. Not exactly being very subtle about what he thinks North Korea wants to get out of this node business, is he? And in one message, Virgil adds, the project could turn into a mildly lucrative little business for whoever does this. Not sounding very good. And the court documents go on to say that once Virgil got to North Korea for the conference, he continued making plans to establish this node in the country and that he planned to return to North Korea and bring the equipment with him. After his arrest, the Ethereum Foundation, that was Virgil's employer, make it clear that Virgil no longer works for them and they did not approve or support his trip to North Korea. Chris Ems says he also had no idea about Virgil's plans. The thing that surprised me and shocked me the most was Virgil's conduct prior to the conference, which none of us were aware of. To my knowledge, no one else who attended the conference knew he was doing that or anything like that. So that, that, was, that was the biggest shocker. The FBI also presents evidence from inside the conference itself. They have audio recordings of Virgil giving his presentation at the conference. It's not clear how they got them or who in the room did the recording. According to these transcripts, Virgil opens his talk saying, the most valuable things we have to offer the DPRK are payments that the USA can't stop. DPRK, of course, stands for the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the official name of North Korea. There were photos too. One shows Virgil drawing a diagram on a whiteboard, which, the prosecutors say, shows how to use cryptocurrency as a means to evade sanctions. Next to the illustration, it's written, no sanctions, yay, and there's a smiley face. In September 2019, Virgil Griffith pleads guilty to conspiring to violate US sanctions. He writes a remorseful letter to the judge saying his actions were arrogant, foolish, and wrong. 
He sentenced in April 2022 to five years in prison and given a $100,000 fine. The US government says Virgil worked over an extended period to advance his cryptocurrency business by serving the interests of one of America's most dangerous and volatile adversaries. But that's not what his supporters believe. Many in the tech community were shaken and outraged by Griffith's prosecution. They say all Virgil actually did was stand in a conference room full of sleepy people, riffing on publicly available information. Here's his friend, Emmanuel Goldstein. When you say providing services to North Korea, at what point does he provide a service to North Korea when he answers a question with, with information that can easily be obtained on the internet? Is that a service? Do you think he was made an example of them by the US government? Oh, absolutely. Do you think anybody's going to want to go to North Korea or you know, answer any questions about anything to people over there? It, it had the desired effect. Absolutely. People are, are, are scared to death of this. What's much less clear is why Virgil did it doesn't seem to me he was interested in making money. There must be far easier ways for someone with his talents to do that. His friend Emmanuel says he was no sympathiser of the regime and wouldn't have intentionally set out to help them. So did he do this, as some of his supporters say, out of an unwavering belief that crypto technology must be borderless and open to everyone? Or was he so driven by libertarian ideals that it blinded him to who he might be helping? At the sentencing, the judge offers his own interpretation. He says Virgil was not motivated by ideology, but by narcissism and the desire to be a crypto hero. The judge notes that in his talks with the FBI, Virgil had offered to spy for the Americans from inside North Korea. He concludes this guy is willing to play both sides as long as he is the center of attention. But Virgil wasn't the only one under the spotlight after the trip to North Korea. I checked in as you would normally, went up to passport control, And for some reason, my passport wasn't going through. That's right. British crypto expert Chris Ems is about to have his own run-in with U.S. authorities. In February 2022, Chris is traveling through an airport in Saudi Arabia after yet another crypto conference when he's taken aside by Saudi police. I was taken to the police station in the airport. Uh, Eventually, I was arrested, detained, then put in handcuffs, both my feet bound and my hands taken to uh, an interrogation centre. Turns out the US government has put out an extradition request for Chris through Interpol. He's bailed, but he's not allowed to leave Saudi Arabia while authorities process his case. And he's lost access to all his money. I tried to go to the ATM to go and buy some water and my debit card didn't work. Within 24 hours after, I started getting emails from all of my banks and cryptocurrency or normal financial services providers that I had, either telling me my account was frozen or my account had been closed. Um, Any funds that I do have left, they've all been frozen now without me having been convicted of any crime. Right. That's a rude awakening. It's uh, it's not a nice feeling. Chris claims he had no clue about Virgil Griffith's plans in North Korea, but he's facing a charge that he entered into a conspiracy with Virgil to violate US sanctions law. In fact, the US government's indictment of Chris says he was one of the conference organizers, along with Alejandro Cao de Benos, North Korea's best friend in the West. And they have evidence. Chris is listed as an organizer on the website advertising the conference. There's even an email address for him there. The indictment also says that after the conference, Chris continued to conspire with Virgil, including assisting him with his efforts to develop potential cryptocurrency infrastructure inside North Korea. Chris admits he invited a few people to the conference simply because he was going. But he says this hardly makes him an organiser. He also denies conspiring with Virgil or any wrongdoing. I gave a speech on, you know, it was about blockchain and finance. To my knowledge at the time, I didn't think I was breaking any laws and I still don't think I was breaking any laws by telling someone uh, how that works because it's common public knowledge. The US government is pretty clear on, on its accusations against you and what it feels that you talked about. Did you appreciate when you went in there that the toxicity of the subject you were talking about, I mean, international finance for a country that's under sanctions, as you knew it was, is, is a really toxic subject? It, it does surprise me that you weren't a bit more cagey about that and, and on, your, on your metal, as it were. Yeah, I think, Jeff, we have to go back to the point I'd made before. And I think anyone that you probably spoke to the conference with me is we were genuinely very frightened at that at, during this time. We didn't have our passports. We were told this thing had to go well. You know, when we were speaking, we were trying to please the, the people that, that were holding our passports. Did you not fear that you might 
either by perception or in law, be accused of, of helping that country? To be honest with you, it, it's kind of the reverse of that. What I was seeing on the news at the time, we were seeing Donald Trump hug Kim Jong-un. You know, things are thawing and it would be nice to, to build relationships with North Koreans if we were all going to be friends. I suppose that's one way of looking at it. But there's another interesting detail in the U.S. indictment against Chris Ems. It contains another short transcript of the recording from that conference of Chris giving an opening talk. He introduces himself as the technology advisor to the Korean Friendship Association, that network of North Korea fans run by Alejandro Cao de Benos. When I spoke to Chris, I asked him directly whether he has any affinity with North Korea. No, absolutely not. Um, one of the things that I'd said when I was interviewed by law enforcement is I'm not Kim Jong-un's best friend. I don't have a, a sympathy for, for the ideas whatsoever. I think going there, you really understand you know, how the country works, regardless of the things that people you know, nitpick over, like are there death camps, are there not? The fact is that it's an enclosed, isolated place where people uh, don't have basic fundamental human rights. I don't have an affinity of any sort towards North Korea. Back when we spoke, Chris was still stuck in Saudi Arabia, unable to leave the country, waiting for the authorities to decide whether to comply with America's request to extradite him. Ultimately, the Saudi government rejected that request, and in September 2022, Chris Ems was free to travel. So where did he go next? Well, it's an interesting story. Chris Ems now lives in Russia. A spokesman representing Chris says he fears that if he returns home to the UK, he'll end up being extradited. So he's decided to live in Russia while he fights to have that Interpol order removed. And he says he likes it there. He's now a regular contributor to Russia's state-controlled news network, Russia Today. None of the other conference goers have faced any legal trouble, but the FBI certainly seems keen to get hold of Chris. In fact, the Bureau has added him to its most wanted list. And there's another new face on that most wanted list, one that is very familiar to me, Alejandro Cao de Benos. There's a picture of him with a big smile, dressed in his North Korean military uniform. He's been indicted, along with Chris, for assisting Virgil Griffith in his sanctions-breaking activities. The United States wants to extradite him along with Chris, but it's unlikely that will happen. Spain doesn't typically extradite its citizens for offenses that aren't crimes in Spain. This isn't the only scrape Alejandro has been in recently. In 2020, he was a subject of an amazing Danish documentary called The Mole. The film involves an elaborate sting where a Danish guy infiltrates the Korean Friendship Association and convinces Alejandro that he can recruit wealthy investors who want to do business in North Korea. Alejandro takes the bait. Hidden camera footage seems to show that he's even willing to help North Korea sell domestically produced drugs and weapons. It's shocking stuff. We need to sit down with the right people straight away. Yes. Sure. So it's going to be complicated to negotiate the sale of whatever uh, short or medium range missiles with a private person. Kind of we are providing technology and we are providing you with experts that you rent. But we are not... We wanted to interview Alejandro too, but he didn't get back to us. But he has said that the US government's charges against him regarding the conference are ridiculous and have no evidence. He says the Mole documentary is biased, staged and manipulated. So, at the end of our story, Virgil Griffith is in jail, Chris Ems is in Russia, holding out against US attempts to extradite him, and Alejandro Cao de Benos is doing the same in Spain. For the American government, the conference was an opportunity to send a clear message to Virgil and Chris's peers. However utopian your ideals might be when it comes to the power of crypto, don't even think about doing business with North Koreans. The conference seems to have been just a smokescreen. It provided a reason to get Virgil and other foreign crypto experts into the country where maybe some deals could be done. When UN investigators took a look at the conference, they said that one of its objectives appeared to be introducing foreign attendees to North Korean companies for the purpose of establishing joint ventures. And so it makes perfect sense that the conference itself was poorly organised and that none of the material went beyond the basics. Because while North Korea might have been interested in Virgil's plan to bring computer equipment into the country, they definitely did not need Virgil and Chris to teach them the basics of cryptocurrency. In fact, the regime's hackers are about to prove just how proficient they already are in this brave new technology. They're about to pull off their biggest jobs yet. 
putting their past bank heists in the shade. Thanks to cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, their profits are going to skyrocket from millions to billions. That's next time on The Lazarus Heist. The Lazarus Heist is an original podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jeff White. And I'm Jean Lee. Our producer is Viv Jones. Our original music was composed by Magnus Fiennes and Il Wu from the South Korean band Jambanai. And as ever, we'd love to hear your feedback. Please keep leaving us those ratings and reviews, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And spread the word on social media using the hashtag Lazarus Heist. Thank you for listening. <laughs>